You're listening to The Mental Money Podcast, the show that shows you how to master your mind to maximize your money. This show is for people who love to watch their bank accounts grow while shifting their relationship to money. Without further ado, let's get these insider insights from today's leading expert. Hi, this is Natalie, and you are listening to The Mental Money Podcast, where we intersect the importance of money and the importance of mindset. Today, we have with us Kelly Showstrom, who is going to be talking to us about how she was able to eliminate 46000 You heard that, $46,000 in debt in 20 months. Now, for some people, that sounds wild, but somebody was able to do it. So today, we're talking to her about how she was able to do it and now how she's helping other people do the very same thing. So Kelly, thank you for being here. Hi so much. Thanks for having me. This is quite yeah, the intro. Course. And um, yeah, I can't <laughs> wait for our conversation. Yeah, of course. So um, where where was that $46,000 in debt? What was, what was it? Credit cards, student loans? So it was, um, it's funny. It was actually all student loans, but mm-hmm. I had credit card debt before that. Um, it wasn't a lot, I would say, especially in like the credit card debt world. Mm-hmm. It was maybe like five grand, but it mm-hmm. was still that, 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 that feeling of, I can never pay it off every single month. I have a balance. I just can't get ahead. All my paycheck is going towards my last month's spending and I need to have my paychecks for this month's spending. And so I, I played the credit card debt game, but that $46,000 is definitely all student loans. Student loans. Okay. So, okay. What did you study that was worth $46,000 right? there? Yeah. Are you using <laughs> that degree today? Um, so it's, I actually, like I am, I can't like hate on my degree. Um, so it was a tradition. I just got an international business degree. Mm. Um, I wanted to study business. I wanted to like run a international corporation, which is kind of the opposite of what I wanted to today, but kind of the same at the same time. But anyway, so I had a business degree. I'm actually in an MBA program also right now Mm -hmm. um, to get my master's in business. And so, and I'm working for a hospital as a project manager. And so I do use it. Um, I also was in the Peace Corps. And so I had a little bit of international work. And so my degrees definitely line up. Um, If you were to ask me, would you write a check for probably 70 grand considering all the interest and everything, right? Would, um, would you pay 70 grand to have the job that you have today? My answer right. would be no. Right? right. Um, right. and that's where I think it's really important, but, um, yeah. So international business, which I guess is somewhat useful. Right. So when you, okay, so let's, let's backtrack when you went, when you started school, you're a freshman in college, what was the conversation around going to school and then like taking out these student loans? Were your your parents around? How did you get introduced to like FAFSA and end up going towards that whole, walk me down that whole road? Yeah. So I actually had parents that were like, you're going to school. It's not really your choice. They Mm -hmm. didn't go to school and they were like, you need a better life for yourself. Right. And I graduated from high school in 05. And so it was the era of School is what you do. It is yeah. important. We're not, in, yeah. we weren't in that world of be an entrepreneur, go test things out. It's okay to fail. Right. And so I knew I had to go to school. Um, I also like, I think I wanted to go to school. I was just having that like phase of not wanting to do what my parents wanted me to do, which is why mm-hmm. I didn't want to go to school. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I picked, I went to a state school, not for any financial reason, just because mm-hmm. that's where I knew a couple of people that went. Um, okay. And it was as about as far as away as I could get um, from my parents with, <laughs> without like them being like, and that's too far. Yeah. Um, it's amazing how many rules they have when they aren't paying for school, right? You're right. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how convenient. <laughs> right. And so um, I went to school with them just saying, you need to take out as many loans as possible for you to pay for this. And Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't in the mindset of you need to take on debt. That wasn't even the conversation. It was, you need to graduate from school and you can think, and Mm -hmm. you're going to get that nice job and then you can pay it off. It's not a big deal. But the fun part about what I do today is yes, that all is good in theory, but if you're not teaching somebody how to actually pay off their debt, or if you're not teaching somebody what um, consolidation looks like, but you're at a higher interest rate or a longer term, that's where it's not making sense and where the student isn't this isn't worth it anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, every year um, I got, I applied just at the bank that was on campus. I didn't even Mm -hmm. like look for rates or anything as I don't think anyone at that age does. Right. Um, We like barely had a checking account on our own, let alone now we're like filing for loans the next year. It's really crazy how that shift works. Um, And the, and the bank would say, great, you qualify 
for twenty thousand. Um, your school is going to cost about fourteen. And I'm like, great, I'll have the twenty. Like that's what I signed up. That's what I qualified for, right? Um, and they also are very good at you don't see your like accruing balance. I never knew how much in total that I had. It was always like a fairly reasonable number. Like you are taking out 10,000, you're taking out 12,000 and all these small numbers felt okay to me. It mm-hmm. wasn't, if they would have said, you're about to sign a check for like a hundred grand, that might've been different. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of how I started. I just started taking out debt and then we all get to that point where we graduate. And then I literally remember asking my counselors, how do I know who to start paying? Like, how do I know how sad, like you're nodding your yeah. head. And it's so yeah. sad because we don't even know who we have loans out with. Yeah. And I was just like praying that they contact me, which don't worry, they do. Right. <laughs> I was praying that yeah. they contact me so that I wasn't going to go into foreclosure or something like yeah. in the future, because I had this debt that I didn't know about. Um, and then that's kind of where it hit me. I was like, oh, shoot, I have a lot of money that I owe. But it didn't hit me enough to change anything about it. It just hit me enough to be like, OK, now I need to start hustling to, mm-hmm. like, make my student loan payment. OK, so what was the what was the amount of the first payment? I think I always owed around I would say it was always around five hundred dollars. So I probably had a loan that was like two thirty, another one that was like two seventy. I think I always mm-hmm. had like two loans and I always averaged around five hundred bucks. Okay, so $500 is not an astronomical amount. No. But it's also like a lot of money depending on who you are and what you're doing, right? So how did you decide that you were going to tackle this and were you like paying more so that you were trying to beat the interest or was there a particular strategy that you implemented that helped you to eliminate it faster? Like what, because 20 months is pretty quick. Yeah. Um, so there was zero strategy, which is why I made the $500 payment for eight months, eight years, sorry. Mm. And nothing happened. Not a darn thing. Right. So I probably graduated with 60, 60 plus who really knows, um, amount of debt, I think around 60. Um, and then eight years later, I woke up one day. Um, I, at this point I had been working, I worked full time since I graduated from college, nothing in the, (laughs) the career field that I wanted, but it was a full-time mm-hmm. job. Right. Um, I also waitressed all the, t- I waitressed since mm-hmm. I was in high school. So I waitressed three or four nights a week. And I just played that game for about eight years. And then I woke right. up one day and I was like, I'm at an age now where like, I was probably, so it wasn't probably quite eight years later, but it was my late twenties. Mm-hmm. Friends started to make decent money. Right. People mm-hmm. are getting their first job that actually pays People are also starting to get married and have kids. And I was just like, I wonder how much I owe. Like, I'm just kind of curious. I've got to be close. I've been paying for so long. And I remember logging into my accounts and I owed $46,000. And I could just like cry right now thinking about it. And I remember thinking like, how, what the hell have I been doing for eight years? Right. How is this so that much? How is this so possible? Like I'm, I'm working, I'm paying my bills. I, I'm paying because they, of course, when you're, when you're in, um, when you have federal loans, you can have payment options and you could pay all these different amounts. And I always paid what I was supposed to. I wasn't the person that paid less or that took, or that paused it for a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. Not that that's bad, but I just, I should have been on the trajectory to pay it off. And so when I woke up, I was like, this has to change. I had a moment and it was done. And Dave Ramsey talks Mm -hmm. about like, that moment exactly. And I had that exact moment. Mm. Um, I think we're lucky if we have that moment because I think so many of us don't. Yeah. So many of us just keep paying the debt and keep making it a monthly bill and don't stress about it. And and so I woke up, I had that, oh crap, what am I going to do? This has to change. I cannot mm. waitress for the rest of my life um, moment. And Dave Ramsey was actually the person that I found. And mm. I was very much Dave ish. I was not doing his plan and I refused to even like contact him in any way because I yeah. was going to, he's going to shame me yeah. nationally. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I was that person in the background that was just like, I'm just, he was my, like my like radical uncle at Christmas that mm-hmm. I was learning, mm-hmm. like, you need to pay more than your minimum. You need to stop wasting money and going out to eat. You need to not get a car loan if you can't even afford to make your rent, right? So I was grabbing, I was smart enough to grab that information from him, but Mm -hmm. I think so many people lose it with him because he is so extreme and then they quit and then they don't do anything, right? And so um, I, I, 
I made a, I did one of those debt free calculators where you can figure out when you're going to become debt free. Mm. And that was kind of like step one. And like at my current yeah. rate at the 500 a month, when am I going to become debt free? And I was like, that date is not okay with me. Right. Mm. So I'm like, how about if I do like 600 a month? And I was kind of like dabbling in like these small numbers that definitely makes you pay it off quick, quicker, but it's not still that quick, I think. Yeah. And so it took about three or four months of me paying like 900 a month or like almost a thousand a month. Right. It took like three or four months of that dabble until I started to like reel in my budget. I actually Mm -hmm. started got a working budget. I figured out my expenses at that point. And then I could start paying 1500, 1800, 1900. And that's where I saw the progress. And then once you see that progress, there is no stopping. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Like before we started, before we hit record, we were talking about like the woo woo part, but really the woo woo, like the mental part of it is really just the fact that you were able to raise your awareness to the fact that this was not work, whatever you were doing was not working. And then that emotional, almost cognitive dissonance in a way triggered that tactical like almost guerrilla militia approach to your money. So the woo woo is not too, it's not too bad. <laughs> it's not too terrible. No, it's not. It's not because honestly, like, so we have a training that helps. It's called the interest eliminator accelerator, right? So essentially what you did, thank you. I came up with it myself. <laughs> it's um, it's essentially what you did. So it takes that like snowball method, yeah. looks at your discretionary income and then shows you your debt-free date. Yeah. And you, I, I kid you not, without fail, every time someone looks at that date and how far out it is, if they continue to make the minimum payments versus making the, um, versus like putting 20, 30, 40, 50% more than what they're paying, how quickly they can reduce their debt. It's, it's an, it's a, it's an awakening almost. And I feel like that's the exact moment you had. Um, So walk me through what that budget looked like when you realized my debt-free day is 10 years down the line. This is how much I'm going to pay in interest. And this is just not going to work. Yeah. So I think um, when I thought of a budget, like when I learned about budgeting and we never called it that it was like balancing your checkbook. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. When I learned about that, it was about just like making sure you pay your bills. It wasn't about tracking money for like groceries or how much you need for Christmas next year, or what Mm -hmm. is this family vacation going to cost? And so I had always done that. I always knew when my bills were due and I always paid them on time. And like, that was my budgeting. And then once I started listening to Dave and realizing what should be included in a budget, I I realized all those other things. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when I started tracking them, um, immediately I knew where it was all going to go. I was 26 years old, 27 mm-hmm. years old. It was all going towards booze and restaurants. Um, I didn't have a fancy car. I didn't, I don't even think I had a car payment at that point. I didn't go on fancy vacations because I was always mm-hmm. working because I couldn't afford it. I was in that mindset of like hustling and grinding and I can't afford anything. Right. Um, but I was also a waitress. So we, I had cash on me all the time. We would go out to the bar next door for drinks after work. We would we had that lifestyle of the restaurant industry. And so Mm -hmm. once I started to, I didn't even like honestly reel that spending in too much. I was just more aware of it. And Mm -hmm. it became quickly that paying off debt that then instead of the $500 minimum payment, then I got to like 1500. I was like, okay, that has to be the non-negotiable number. And then it got to 2000 and more eventually. Right. Mm -hmm. So then it became, my budget became, okay, you can spend $2,000 on your extra payment, right? And you can do whatever you want with that other money. If you want to only buy vodka for the rest of the month, (laughs) like do whatever you got to do. And it doesn't become that priority, but it's that mindset of like allowing myself to blow whatever money that I make beyond that 2000 on whatever I want. And Mm -hmm. at that point, when I was at that age, I also wasn't saving for big expensive vacations. I also wasn't having to pay for a down payment on a house. Right. So I could afford to do that. Um, It was just like food on the table, gas to get to work. And then like going out was, Mm -hmm. I think the three expenses that we had in our late 20s. Right. So back to the mental piece, right? 
whenever you do set a big goal like that, it can be overwhelming and looking at those numbers and looking at those decisions that you have to make and sacrifices in some cases, because it was a sacrifice for you. Cause you could have easily been like, I'm not sacrificing my time out. I'm young. I'm going to have fun. I deserve this. Right. And that's the, that's the conversation that a lot of people have. And looking at that sacrifice that you had to make, it seemed like instead of getting overwhelmed, it kind of motivated you to move toward and the looking at that debt-free date, right? Kind of motivated you to move towards knowing that this is what I have to do. But I've I've noticed just in my work that some people, when they have to make that decision, when they get to that moment, right? I'm gonna put the two thousand dollars aside. How did you not justify not putting it aside? Because that happens sometimes. It was getting rid of that student loan debt was like my ultimate. Like I had like tunnel vision. That was the only thing that I was doing. I wasn't accomplishing anything else at that age. I wasn't going to mm-hmm. grad school. Like I said, I wasn't trying to buy a house that was eating me alive. Yeah. And some people, especially some of my clients that I work with, when your debt isn't eating you alive, it's hard to convince you to pay it off. Right. Yeah. And then the conversation just turns to, okay, then how can you just clean things up to not live paycheck to paycheck because Mm -hmm. it doesn't always have to be getting rid of your debt isn't always your goal um I wish it was everybody's goal it was definitely my goal it definitely helps with you with your future financially but Mm -hmm. you have to be hungry for it you have to want it and I think when I work with people or when I see people that do it for a couple of months or do that calculator like you mentioned and they see if you keep doing what you're doing, this is what you're at. And they have to honestly do a gut check. Am I okay with that? And some mm-hmm. people unfortunately say yes. Yeah. Or am I here for bigger things? And this is not okay. And if I just hustle for 20 months and pay this debt off and mind you, I did not make six figures. I could, if I made like a decent salary, I could have had that debt paid off within a year. Mm-hmm. Right. But I was still going out all the time and I only made like 60 grand at my job. And then I waitressed. And so I think that's the kicker is I wanted it more than anything. And so I was able to pay off a lot of debt with a limited salary because that was the only thing that I was focusing on at that point. And Mm -hmm. I think you do become a little bit more motivated. Like I said, in the beginning, I was like, maybe I'll pay $600 a month. And then you realize that that's not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And I could have easily at that point been like, hey, this just isn't for me. Right. But that mindset of I need to do better. I can do better. I want more. I deserve more. Um, knowing that I was meant for more is what kind of kept me going. And when you think about it, I mean, 20 months versus eight years. Oh, if I, if I, I get so mad about that. If I would have started the second I graduated from college, where were my parents? If I would have started the second I graduated from college, I still had basically the same. I had a different job. I made some more money at the end of it, but I could have figured it out. Right. And I was still waitressing if I would have just even spent 24 months Mm -hmm. right when I graduated from college, that would have saved me nine, 10 years of of interest, Mm -hmm. which is crazy. And so I love when I find those like 22 year olds that are dabbling and like, Hey, how can I pay off my debt? And I just want to like grab them and like, your life is going to be so good. Mm -hmm. You can just get this together. Yeah, for sure. Have you ever had a conversation with your, well, do you, first of all, do you have any siblings? I have a brother. Yeah. I have a twin brother. A twin brother. Okay. So you guys were going through this around the same time. Did he go to school as well? He did. He was like the good kid in high school and then (laughs) flunked out of college because you know how like the good, like the good kids in high school, they like, don't learn like when you're supposed, like, I think when you like mess up in high school and by messing up, I mean like maybe you get caught drinking or you get bad grades and your parents yell at you or you like, get in a car accident and you have to deal with Mm -hmm. like that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, I think you learn those life lessons under your parents' roof, which is a really safe place to do it. Like if you're fortunate enough to be in that situation. Um, but, and my brother didn't like flunk out of college, but he definitely was not asked to come back. And then he had to eventually (laughs) go back and then he like joined the military and spiraled, spiraled, spiraled. But no, even to this day, he's actually been in one of my um, group coaching classes. Mm-hmm. Um, we are very different when it comes to money, but we both very much agree that our parents didn't teach us what we needed to know. Which is the the next piece. Did you ever revisit this conversation with your parents? Like, have you ever had like a heart to heart about finances and what they didn't teach you, what they knew and like really assess some of the messages that you got from them back then? I know you're enjoying the episode, but I wanted to quickly let you know about the book Converted. Uncover the hidden strategies you need to achieve massive credit score success. 
As you are on your financial journey, this book is designed to be the guide towards ensuring that your journey is as smooth as possible. Doesn't matter if you're clearing up your mindset or on the verge of having more money, credit is going to follow you forever. I bet you that you'll see. As you begin and continue to apply the resources mentioned in any given episode, credit will continue to come up and we want you to get right. Go ahead and head to www.convertedcredit.com. That's www.convertedcredit.com. That's www.convertedcredit.com and get your copy today. Girl, this is a really good question. I, um, not to bring up Dave Ramsey again, but he has a really good quote where he mentions like, you can't talk how does he say it? Like, you can't talk about money to people that used to like wipe your butt. He calls it like the, the, like the poopy butt syndrome or something weird Mm -hmm. like that. Um, and and it's kind of true, right? Like I paid out $46,000 in 21s. I, people literally pay me to teach them how to get out of debt. I have like all the things and my parents are still like doing their own thing because I think, I, th- I don't know what it is. And um, my mom actually will dabble and ask me questions that are really interesting. And she like mm-hmm. is kind of curious and she's definitely the saver. My dad is definitely the spender. I could see mm-hmm. it. Um, but they've always been like, I think they're fortunate enough to not have a ton of debt. They have like yeah. a normal amount of American manageable debt, right? Mm-hmm. The he bought a tractor, that kind of debt, yeah. um, or they have a boat, like that kind of debt, fancy debt, they have fancy debt. Yeah. And so I think when you have fancy debt, you're, there's nothing burning you to pay it off. And so they're mm-hmm. kind of just like maintaining. Um, it's going to be really interesting when they get to that age where retirement is a, is a conversation. Cause um, mm-hmm. I just think that they're not interested in what I have to say. And I, and I don't want to push them. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's funny have because my mom, I did. Actually, did she was not very receptive to it, no. but it, and and that's just like on the intellectual level. But I I noticed that. So let me actually tell you a cute story. So one day, um, I was doing a podcast, and I'm like giving all these resources and tips and stuff because I I like to like give everything away, like yeah, kitchen sink ticket, yeah. And I find like she sends me to her office one day to go find a notebook for her, and I'm like looking through the notebooks to see which one it is, and I see like little notes that she made when she was listening to me on that podcast. Isn't that the cutest thing? Oh my god! <laughs> I know. So it wasn't a direct like, yes, That's I it. hear you. It is, and and even like her letting me you know, help her with her credit and help her purchase a home and helping her with retirement. Like there, she took the more indirect approach, like, okay, you can do this. I trust you to do this versus like, I messed up. I'm sorry. And you know, this, that was her way of showing me that she was um, apologetic and empathetic towards the things that we went through growing up. But no, there was never a direct, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. I didn't (laughs) teach you everything you were supposed to know, but um, that's what like, I'm that. waiting for. I'm waiting for the moment that they're like, I'm ready. Give me everything. Right. And I don't right. think we're ever going to get that from our parents. Right. No, true. Okay. Well, speaking of parents, you recently married and yeah. do you, do you plan on having kids? I'm not asking to be invasive. I just want to yeah. segue yeah. into a question about children. Yeah. Yeah. We plan on having, I think a child. Yes. A child. Okay. One, this one. Just, yeah, I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> so, um, with that being said, you know, with your own mistakes and your own, I guess, miseducation from your parents, what are some things that you want to pass on about money that you think are important to learn? And how soon do you want to start enforcing some of those messages? Yeah, that's definitely um, an area that I think, I think once you become in a new, like in a situation, you then is your time to like learn more about it. And what I mean by Mm -hmm. that is like, um, I haven't dived into the the theories of like how to teach your children about money um Mm -hmm. I know enough to teach my clients about how to do it but I'm definitely going to start it from an early age um Mm -hmm. they even are giving like toddlers money lessons right like so you start it from day one basically and then just those simple simple principles of like you have to um when you earn money and you earn money differently at different ages. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you earn money, you have to, you get to enjoy some of it. You also have to save some of it. You also have to give some of it away. Right. Just like kind of those three principles. And so whether you're giving it away as in like buying lemonade at your neighbor's lemonade stand, Mm -hmm. or you want to donate to buy candy bar at school, like Mm -hmm. whatever it looks like at their age group, whatever makes sense at their age. Um, 
And that's principles that need to be distilled in day one, because otherwise we get these adults that quote unquote can't afford to donate, right? Because they don't make enough money when we all can. And actually when you donate, you feel better about yourself. You feel better about the community that you live in and you're, it boosts up your mindset. Like I'm sure you know all about this and you actually prosper more when you donate, which is for sure. And if you don't learn that at an early age, it's really hard to give your money away when you don't feel like you have enough money, right? Mm-hmm. That's a total mindset thing too. And so, and that now I I love that we will be having kids in an age of technology because now there's all these like banking accounts and apps where you can help your children create a budget with their money. You can actually pay them for their chores on like these apps and on, you mm-hmm. can like pause their cards so that they can't use it or they can only use a certain amount of money or, yeah. and so there's a lot of fancy things that parents can do with their kids, but it's definitely important to teach them from day one. This is how you just manage your money. It's not even about a budget or about um, saving or reconciling your account. It's just that you should know how much you are coming, how much is coming in. You should know how much is coming out and that coming out needs to be dispersed a little bit. It needs to be even because when we, um, when we're doing too much of one thing, it's, we're not, we need to spread it. I'm trying to think of the word that I'm trying to think of. Keep it. We need to balance. balance. Yeah. We need to, if we're spending too much in one area, it doesn't feel good. Right. And so having fun with some being responsible with some, um, really important. Okay. No, I feel you that that's very valid. Um, walk me through a budget. How do we, Mm. if we wanted to set one up today, um, we make, okay, we make $2,000 a month, hypothetically, and we have $700 in expenses, just the, just the necessities, not including like, um, variable income, like gas or things that change month to month. So we have two grand, we have 700 in fixed income, um, and then maybe like three to 400 in variable income. What does that look like as far as what we can do, how to maximize that, um, maybe a few scenarios with different types of debt and what some options are. Wow, girl. Okay. So (laughs) a budget, I always say like personal finance is just that it is personal, right? And so in order for any budget to work, you have to run it with your numbers. You can't download a template from online being like, Mm -hmm. this is what your budget should consist of. Um, And we all do different things. And so $2,000 $2,000 a month, $700 is our expenses. The first thing you're going to ask is like your, your, um, the four walls, your, um, your necessities, your bills, they have to come out first, right? The things mm-hmm. that people are going to be knocking on your door if you don't pay those things. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing that people I think get caught up is those things can be, um, some people would say like Netflix, it's a bill, right? But it's not a necessity. And so mm-hmm. let's look at like, the food, let's look at, um, and we're talking about just like food on the table. We're not buying bougie groceries at like Hopefully. whatever store. Yeah. yeah. I would say lots <laughs> of barley's, but yes. Um, we get to that point, but we're not there in the beginning. So we need food. We need just clothing on our back. We need to pay our rent and we need to pay our utilities. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's the first next should come out of your paycheck. And so let's say I'm going to boost up the numbers just to a thousand dollars that we have for those to include our rent a little bit. So a thousand dollars for expenses. So we only have a thousand dollars left. And that's why paying off your debt is so important because when you only have a thousand dollars left, do you want some of it going towards just like interest that you don't even get to like see or, or enjoy? Absolutely not. And I think when people start to understand that they're like, wait a minute, I can spend $20 on interest on my credit card, or I could have like kind of free Netflix and Hulu. Absolutely. And so then you want to do what is like living cost you. That's kind of the next tier Mm -hmm. down of expenses. And that is maybe a little bit more groceries, right? Maybe you want to make sure that we, we for sure have plenty of food on the table and the fridge is stocked. Um, Maybe that's where you put your car payment. Um, If you have a loan on your car, this is where also you put your gas. Um, Mm -hmm. This is where you put things like childcare or Mm -hmm. um, things that maybe don't have to happen, but have to happen for how your life is maintaining at this moment. Yeah. Um, and you'll see quickly that that thousand dollars is probably already gone. Right. So then you have to like negotiate with yourself. What is more important? Um, and sometimes the answer aren't, isn't, isn't easy. Um, but it all comes down to one of two things. You either need to increase your income or you need to reduce your expenses. Right. Mm -hmm. We, we can't just like print more money, unfortunately. And so if you are running out of money, ask yourself one of those two, if you're living the paycheck to paycheck lifestyle, if you are creating this budget with us and you're running down the list of all of your expenses and you're like, there's nothing left, 
either you have too many expenses or you have not enough income, right? And mm-hmm. not enough income is always a problem, which is why I was waitressing and other people's side hustle and why that's such a big thing right now. Um, and then the last tier, when if we still have money yet left, right? We're praying for it. That's where you do like your fun stuff. That's where you mm-hmm. want to make sure you're saving for like big things annually. Christmas, mm-hmm. should you should start saving for that January one. You need to be saving buckets. I um, They're sinking funds. Um, is what they're just basically larger expenses that you break down and you're saving a little bit of amount, a little bit of money every single month over a long period of time. Um, you want sinking funds for birthdays. You want them for gifts. You want mm-hmm. them for um, long weekends. You yeah. want just his and her spending money is a really big one. If you share money with somebody, mm-hmm. um, you want to be able to spend money and your spouse to not be allowed to ask questions about where that money went. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so th- all of those things need to be included, the necessities, the kind of living life, and then the the sinking funds, like the fun parts of life. All of those need to be included in a well-balanced budget. Mm-hmm. How much money each of those items get will depend on what your income is that you're working with. Mm-hmm. And also the specific of those items um, will depend on the income that you're working with. If you want, I'll share with you a link. Um, I have this 100 items to build out your budget free PDF. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's basically just like, here's 100 things which makes what makes sense in your life because i think we often forget um i also have this other tool it's a 90-day expense tracker it's on my website um it's free and it it has you track your expenses from your last 90 days and then when you track those expenses from the last 90 days not only does it tell you how much you averagely spend in categories but it also tells you about spending areas that you may not remember like it's i'm sure you hear this all the time from people too where they're like i don't like normally buy this but like this and you're like Girl, it's on yeah. here for, bought- for 12 months. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know. Let's just be honest. You always buy it. And let's <laughs> just put it in the budget and let's be done with it. Right. Right. Um, and so that 90 day expense tracker will help you realize where your money is actually going. And then it yeah. helps you instead of being like, okay, how much money should I save for, for groceries every month? And you, this big task of like, I have no idea. Like, are you a family mm-hmm. of four? Are you a family of one? Like, do you like bougie groceries? Do you eat macaroni and cheese every day? Mm-hmm. That 90 day expense tracker will help you actually figure out how much you spend on groceries every single month. So, mm-hmm. um, so that's the basis of it. You want that income and you want it to be zero based, a zero based budget. And what I mean by mm-hmm. that is you want your income to go down to zero after this mm-hmm. budget. It doesn't mean that you're spending that money every month, but it means it's accounted for. It means that every single dollar has a job. It means mm-hmm. that this dollar is going for Christmas. This dollar is going towards your MBA program that you're not going to start for four years from now, but you're trying to build up that bank, right? Yeah. And so you're kind of naturally building in a buffer into your checking account at the same time because you're saving in so many different categories. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. And I'm glad you mentioned the tracking piece because I think that's where a lot of people get overwhelmed because I have to look at all of this stuff. Like if I had personally, if I had to look through all of my transactions month to month, I'd cry. It's way too much, right? No, honest, no, truly. And that's coming from a personal finance professional, right? Yeah. I don't want to do it. So the fact that you have that resource that can kind of streamline it for people is really, really valuable. So could you just talk a little bit more about how exactly the tracking works? I know you said it categorizes it, Yeah. but what are they doing? Are they uploading it into like, are they uploading their bank statements into a system and then it extracts the data or like, and then what are other like, data points that people can see. Yeah. Um, No, girl, this is an Excel spreadsheet that I created, which I feel like I'm like a semi Excel genius, but like (laughs) not nearly. Take take all the credit. (laughs) Right. Like I see people like, do you follow Miss Excel on Instagram? She's like so crazy. And she just like dances and talks about Excel formulas. It's like a very weird thing. But Mm -hmm. if you like Excel, follow her anyway. um, Not a plug. She gives me no money. Um, But uh So basically it's an Excel spreadsheet and you just type in, and this is painful, right? But it's like our spending, we need to feel that to make a change. We need to type in every single time we went to Starbucks to feel that change. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this just gives you the knowledge of where does my, where did my spending go in the last three months? Um, And right now we're in, we would be December. We're filming this in March. And so it would be December, January, and February that you're tracking Watch out for December because you have weird wonky things happening during Christmas, yeah, right? True. So maybe you sp- maybe you sp- pick a different month. So there's kind of those caveats, but basically you just enter all of your transactions from all of your cards, um, anywhere that you spend money into this Excel spreadsheet, and you say what category it is. 
Mm. you're typing in the category. So you're creating it yourself for your spending habits. And then it uh, does fam- fancy formulas. And then it tells you a three month, it tells you how much each month you have in spending in each of those categories. And then it does a three month average. So it says okay. on average, you spend this much per month. And okay. that's just to get you to like, not to overwhelm people. That's just to get you to like, where am I at? What do I do? Baseline. It's, yeah. Yes. It's not helping you with like, your future, it is helping you actually with your future budget, but it's, this is not your budget. Right. And then, so I also have a budgeting spreadsheet that I help with clients and you can also download them online. Like they, they're easy to find. You can also just make it on a notepad, but just are fairly easy. As long as you have the tools of like, what does my budget need to consist of? Um, and that's what we're talking about here. But then once my clients are sophisticated enough and they just understand these principles that we've been talking about today. That's where I'm, I'm tell people go get an app, go get some software, make it easy on yourself, connect Mm -hmm. it to your bank automatically. Don't try to like recreate the wheel. Don't try to like do pivot tables and these fancy aligning Mm -hmm. with the universe situations. Like just, I, I use YNAB. They don't pay me, unfortunately. Um, Not yet. Not yet. yet. They don't pay anybody. No, no. Someday they're going to pay the people because the people yeah. love them. Um, it stands for you need a budget and mm. it is um, my saving grace. It makes me so that I, like you said, I don't have to track every single penny, but every single penny does come through and mm. I do see it coming through. And, but I can, it's, it literally is like, you were at hy V. is that groceries? And I'm like, hell yeah, it was groceries. And I click yes. Mm. And then it, it mm. does the math in the back end. It does. It tells me how much I have available to spend. So I don't have to worry about, um, am I going to have enough to pay my bills next month? Because it's right. all kind of, it's doing the math and there's other, you can do mint. Mint is a original. They've been around forever. Um, free mm-hmm. software. So I definitely recommend people once you kind of figure out where has my spending gone? Um, how, what categories do I need to use moving forward? How mm-hmm. much money do I make? Then once you figure all of those pieces out, then start using a tool to help you follow that plan. Mm, got you. So in addition to the one-on-ones, you also have a course. Could you walk us through what the course is out, what the course outlines and like what the objective and takeaways are? Absolutely. And the course was created based off the teachings of my one-on-one coaching and it's to make it available for like the masses, right? It's so that more people can get in on it at an affordable rate, which is what all courses are. Um, And so basically there's four pillars to what I teach. There are um, four areas that you need to like dabble in and or master to get good with your money. So Mm. the first is creating your budget. And that's step one for a reason, because you just have to get that in line. Um, And I'm really curious someday to talk about your budget, because Mm. a budget can be as specific as like knowing how much you spend on toilet paper, which Mm. is maybe where my husband dabbles on that end. (laughs) He's a crazy geek person. Or to dabble in the, I save this much every single month, this much Mm -hmm. is how much my bills go towards and everything else I can do whatever the hell I want with. Right. And so that's like a budget for people that don't want to budget anyway. So the first pillar is budgeting. The second one is paying off our debt. And that is Mm -hmm. reducing that debt just gives us more money to do all the things that we want with. And so whether debt is your like arch nemesis, like it was for me, or Mm -hmm. if you just want more money to go on vacation with, and you don't care about the debt, but it's a side effect. Um, it's really important to just rein that in. If you don't have any debt, congratulations. You right. definitely deserve to, to move on. Right. But you have a mortgage probably. So I'm going to say, Eric, also, do you ever find that when people, when you ask them how, what debt they have, that they like exclude certain items that they feel like aren't debt? Like the mortgage, yeah. The car yeah. payment. The car payments, yeah. Oh, so we're, we're calling all of you people out that are thinking you don't have any debt and you probably <laughs> right. do. Mm-hmm. Um, Anytime you owe money to anybody for anything, that's debt. Okay. Right. Budget, debt. The third one is sharing money with your partner. And that is um, sharing money with a spouse. It also could be sharing money with a roommate or talking, having about um, having uh, positive money conversations with friends, being Mm -hmm. able to like open up about like, I can't go to this dinner. It's too expensive. Or we're going on a girl's trip and we need to make sure that we're tracking how much everybody's spending so that people pay Mm -hmm. each other. Right. It's about just opening up these conversations and knowing, especially if you have a partner, we'll go back to that example. Um, who's going to actually do the budget every month? The answer should be both of you in some way or form, but who's doing the tangible pieces? When are you going to sit down and have these conversations? When are you going to talk about your quarterly goals, your annual goals and beyond? How are you going to track your net worth? Just like starting those conversations um, Mm -hmm. because that is the number one reason for divorce, right? And so if we can just, and not only that, it just makes our life a little bit easier when we have those conversations. Okay. 
And then the last piece is our mindset piece, right? And that is what um, you you guys are doing here and you guys excel in. I always talk about, um, we were talking before the recording, the woo and the work, right? And I mm-hmm. do a lot of the work, but it's mm-hmm. really important to do the woo because you need that mindset. You need to, this isn't a short game thing that we're playing, right? Yeah, like this right. is long-term and this is, you think when you're getting out of debt that once you get out of debt, like that's kind of the end game, but that's just the beginning. Then you get to start thinking about funding these long-term goals and having fun with your money and enjoying it and making sure you're boosting up for retirement. And there's this whole fire community that you all of a sudden learn about that are retiring at the age of 30. And you're like, how are they right. doing this? And how so right. this mindset piece is so important. Um, and so that's kind of the last piece. And it's the last piece because you can't start off with mindset. When you have a hundred thousand dollars of debt and you owe everyone and their money, mother money, you can't say, I'm good at money. I deserve to like, right? Like that doesn't work. And yeah. so you need, <laughs> you need to get your budget in line, figure out your plan for your debt. You need to like get some confidence. And then that mindset piece is just like, that's a long term. We are always, always working on it. So those are yes. kind of the four pieces. That's an interesting point because it's, you have to reverse engineer it. You're right. I know you you don't know what comes to mind until you take that action until you've made a decide like a committed action you then you'll see those things start popping up like the justifications and what comes into your awareness and you know like you know what and honestly one of the other things I noticed come up a lot too is people start to learn about their own relationships with being able to trust themselves like can you trust yourself with your money can you trust yourself to make these decisions Can you trust yourself to make these sacrifices? Can you keep promises to yourself? If you promise to put aside $20 a a week, example, do you really do it? Do you really fall through on your own promises? And you can see how those themes kind of play out in everyday life, like in in other areas of their lives too. So no, you're right. The the awareness piece and the mindset piece doesn't come until after the fact, um, until you take a decided action. Absolutely. Like I've started to have group coaching classes where mindset is day one. And it's really hard to get yeah. people on day one to be like, let's close our eyes and imagine a life. They're like, no, no that, that, that no. world doesn't exist, which is yeah. why I'm here right now. Right. And right. even the mindset piece, I struggled a long time and still do, if we're being honest with you're in that hustle for so long of, I need to just save every single penny that I have. Mm-hmm. I literally had to like, I thought about buying a $20 book yesterday, like an entrepreneur, financial, like goddess, wonderful person book. Mm -hmm. And it was $20 on Amazon. And I was like, Kelly, buy it. Like, stop it. Like, what are you, you want to read this book? You've looked it up on Amazon 20 times. You're getting ads about it now. (laughs) Right? Like, just buy it. it, it, It's it's, it's not a light switch. It doesn't just flip where you're like saving 24 seven. And then now you can actually kind of enjoy some of that money. And so that is a, you have, um, your work is so important because um, so many people need that at honestly every stage of their financial journey. A good example of this like mindset shift. If you listen to like the budgetista who is so mm-hmm. wonderful, she mm-hmm. talks about um, how she's still, I don't know if she still has it. I think she does um, this car that literally every time she goes to start it in the morning, yeah. she like mm-hmm. prays that it starts. Yeah. And she like every day is like, Tiffany, you're like a millionaire. Can yeah. you just go buy a ten thousand dollar car? car. Yeah. And she's and ever and she doesn't do it. And she's like, it is a total mindset piece. And I think yeah. that's how messed up it can be. It could. It really is a really hard thing to tackle. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're like us talking about it right now. Of like, I have a limiting mindset belief. I worry about the money that I have because I was in debt for so long and I struggled with that so so much. Right. Starting those conversations and normalizing them is really important because we all have those mindset issues. So um, one of the things that I struggled with for a really long time and sometimes still creeps up is the fact that I, the mindset piece is that some things work for you so long, you don't realize that they're a problem. Yeah. Right. Like they're, they're just kind of lingering there. And I, that's another reason why I think we do have to reverse engineer it because we don't know what we don't know. Right. Like we, we have this, well, I still have this sometimes it's really still creeps in where I'm just like, okay is this a need? Is this a want? Mm -hmm. And watching how those, like those, your mind kind of plays tricks on you sometimes and like really getting clear about defining what, what you're okay with, what you're not okay with. You spoke about like increasing your income. That's a whole other mindset piece too, but then definitely having to deal with those lingering underlying issues around, you know, 
this has worked for me so long. Why do I need to change this? I've gotten by and I truly believe and in a way I'm grateful for what the, how the pandemic has shed light on like how jacked up the financial system is as a whole and how it impacted us on a personal level, like how we really can't rely too much on government, how, you know, the government is still sorting out what they have going on financially. And these things are not working. We have to, we have to make that shift and people like you are important. The, the fact that you have, let me just talk about how much I love the fact that your course addresses having conversations around money because mm-hmm. we don't, right. Mm-hmm. A lot of people would rather pull their own teeth out than talk about money, ask for money that's repaid, give money, like those things. Um, which brings me to a question I have about, if you don't mind sharing, Maybe like you newly being married, what were some of the conversations you and your partner had that made you feel confident in knowing like this is, this could work. And then like, if it doesn't work, I trust that this person will help me adjust. Yeah. So I talk about our money. We're an open book, whether Derek has agreed to it or not. We talk talk about our financial (laughs) situation all the time. Uh, It's not a secret, right? Like this is just like, yeah life. And I would tell my girlfriend of like how Derek and I split money. And so I feel like the the internet deserves to know. Um, But there's a lot of different ways. I actually have like just like a a easy freebie too. And you could Google this online, right guys? Like how do you share money with your partner? And there's usually like one of five ways and it can be um, and, and the, the three that I speak to a lot is like, you either do, we're all in hundred mm-hmm. percent. You could do 50, 50, mm-hmm. right. We're, we're even, or you do the whole, we each have our own account, but we have a shared account and then that game. Right. So yeah. Derek and I, for the longest time did that last option. We had our own separate finances. Um, this is before we were married. Um, but we had that shared account. We had a shared account from pretty early on. Um, but I knew that he was, going to be a good partner financially when we were, um, we bought a house after a year of meeting each other. Um, and he had money like as a down payment on the house. And I was in that credit card phase that we talked about Mm -hmm. in the very beginning of the podcast. And I had to like borrow five grand from him or whatever the number was to just get ahead of that payment. Right. And so I was like, he's way better at money than I am. So like, we when, we, when we were going through that, that was way before money gal, that was way before me paying off my debt. That was like, I was still waitressing and hustling. Um, and we had always been good at communicating about like your, how much money needs to go into the house, how much money does our life cost? Um, and we, and that was when I just started dabbling about what we're, what I do today. Um, and for the longest time, we always had our finances in that way. We always had separate money because it worked well for us, right? He could spend money on video games or his fantasy football boys weekend. And I could go on vacation with my friends or I I was just more social. And so I could do all the happy hours. This is obviously pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, all the happy hours, all the fun, friend things without having to worry about like that being a thing in our relationship, yeah, right? right? And if you're a personality that that might be a thing in your relationship, don't let it be. Right. And that's like the biggest kicker. And so we actually just switched to um, everything is everything, which Mm -hmm. is really interesting. Yeah. Um, But we do have his and her money, which is really important to have money for each of you to spend without questions asked. Mm -hmm. Um, But it still takes some trust. You can't, I don't recommend that people start that way in the beginning because you have to trust that your partner is going to, when they go to buy groceries, that they aren't buying all the junk and ruining all your money and you're not going to have actual vegetables, right? right. Or you have to trust that your partner is, um, this sounds silly, but like categorizing things correctly, where if you did go to Target, don't just put it in like the house money. If you bought yourself like a pair of jeans, right? Yeah, like right. that you're taken from house money that we have to like buy paper towels with. And it sounds silly, but like that's no, how it's fights true. start. Like yeah. that's how, and so you, I think you can build and you can get to that point where it's equal, but you should always have conversations. You should always know. And I must say like, it's funny being in like this financial world. He actually does all the bills and stuff. I, mm-hmm. my brain just doesn't, <laughs> I, I feel like my brain is on all day, every day that I'm like, what the mortgage? Like sometimes I just like float around space and, but that's his, like, like he loves it. He loves yeah. knowing like, I'm not going to pay him until the day before it's due because they don't need our money early. And I'm like, great. I would have paid it the second I got an email about it because right. that's just like when I need to get it done. And so it's about figuring out your strengths within the relationship and who can do what. And then I come in with the 
let's break down this vacation. How much is it going to cost to us to go back to Minnesota for this wedding? And mm-hmm. are we flying or are we driving? And I help with like, I'm, I love sinking funds and mini budgets and all that kind of stuff. And so it's partnering, it's making sure you always have honest conversations. And even when you have friends, making sure that when you're going on a friend's vacation, knowing ahead of time, yeah. how is this getting split up? Are we sharing everything? Um, is everyone, everyone is on their own. Do we want to get an app like split wise, which is my favorite thing in the world. Also no plug. Mm-hmm. I need to start getting money from these people. Yeah. Um, for real. <laughs> <laughs> split wise so that you can keep track of the spending so that, you know, you don't have that friend that never buys anything and then they mm. get like a free trip and, or you end up paying for everything because you don't think you paid enough right. and you actually paid for everything. So um, yeah, there's a lot of different nuggets in that section of the course to just mm-hmm. explain how can we do this a little bit better. Oh my gosh. I love it. So if anyone wants to get in touch with you, how would they do that? So the easiest way um, is moneygalcoaching.com. I'm also on Instagram. um, And if you go to my website, I have a ditch debt and live rich free Facebook community. And it's Mm -hmm. just a way for us to like be in a safe space and talk about money. Right. So if you are wanting to like surround yourself with this topic, that's definitely a great place to go. But moneygalcoaching.com is a great place. And if you're interested in the course or just like figuring out how to do this, um, you can just schedule a free call and we can just chat about about um, where you're at and what you need and all that sort of thing. Well, we'll see if we're a good fit. It's not always a good fit, but yeah. yeah. Are you on Instagram or I like... am? It's, okay. Yeah, Instagram. Did I not say that? Yeah, Instagram at Money Gal Coaching. Um, uh, yeah, that's probably like my primary um, social media tool besides the Facebook group. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely leave all of that information in the show notes. Thank you, Kelly, again, so much for coming. I feel like I got a wealth of information. I'm sure others feel the same way and. I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be talking. (laughs) (laughs) I agree. Thank you so much. It was a lot of fun and good luck to everybody. Of course. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Mental Money Podcast. Please go ahead and remember to subscribe, but don't hoard all of this good information for yourself. Share this information with someone that you know could use it, especially if they need a shift in their mindset or someone who would love to have more money. So until we meet again, remember, like Uncle Snoop said, keep your mind on your money and your money on your mind.